Acts 20, verse 24. Acts 20. If, again, I don't say this a lot here because of the pews. The pews are hard to get in and out of. I understand. But if you would like to get preacher friendly, would like to move closer, you're sure welcome to. You know, I'll pull on the other campus to do that because it's easier to get out of the chairs. But I got all kind of room up front. Love to have you. I just quit messing with you because you got so comfortable in those pews. Oh, my goodness. And the thing that I don't want to see in your life is for you to get too comfortable. So then I got to ask the question, are you comfortable? Acts chapter 20, verse 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. The Apostle Paul speaking, formerly known as the artist Saul. Now, Paul, I thought that was funny. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. So much power in this verse. I consider my life worth nothing. Which in other words, I'm, I'm looking at my life and saying, I'm not trying to compare it to anyone else. This is my life. And, and what I've done is in the past, I'm pressing on to the forward. I've got to aim to finish the race. Paul speaks a lot about running the race, staying in the race. The race is so important in our life that Jesus has given me. He gave me a simple task, and that task was to testify the good news of God's grace. Whether I'm building tents or I'm traveling across the seas or whatever I'm doing, I've got to testify about the grace of God. And if you are born again, then you understand how powerful the grace of God is in your life. It was grace that saved you. It was grace that set you free. You, you, and I, you have to ask yourself, who are you racing? Who are you racing? Let me help you. It's not the one next to you. It was the one you saw in the mirror this morning. Your race has to do with you and you alone for you to press in. Our race can be impeded by comparing our race to others. I look at other people's growth in God, and I look at mine and say, now, I, I can't, I could be impeded by that. I don't want that to happen. I want to keep on pressing. Comparison, my friend, becomes a trap. I have for the last six weeks or so been uh, exercising and uh, or exercising my right not to eat. Amen. I've been uh, uh, rehabbing. And I found this is to be a funny thing. I can get in there uh, at this uh, fitness place that I'm at, and I can work out. And I'll find myself looking at somebody else that's really going after it. Oh, man, I could be on the treadmill, and somebody, one of them young pups, will get on that treadmill next to me, and they'll hit that thing climbed up like that, and they'll kick it into about 10 mile an hour, and they're running and getting it. And I'm sitting there at 2.2 mile an hour on a flat plane, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm fitting to race this dude. And I start hitting that button, and I realize I can't stay with this guy. <laughs> Amen. This is not, I can't compare myself to what this young buck's doing. I, I, now I can say I'm closer to 60 than I've ever been in my life. Amen. So I bring that thing back down and, and try to get my heart rate from exploding and but as I move through life I find myself comparing my life with those in the other lane and I, one of the hardest things about life is this issue of comparison always comparing ourselves to others and what we've seen either on tv the, or here on the internet or here or pick up from somewhere else, and God help us. Father, I thank you for your word. I ask that you would help us to run our races, to thank you for the grace, and God to be a witness of it. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Comparison is what I want to really nail with on this, this uh, morning. Comparison is the number one result of destroying ministries. When you compare yourself to others, you begin to destroy ministry, you begin to destroy your life, you start looking around. Satan was kicked out of heaven out of comparison. He began to exalt himself. I'm not going to go into all the scripture on it in the Old Testament, but the Bible says that Satan was to be a conduit of worship. He was to be stepping out and, and to build the worship in, up in the house known as Lucifer. And he made these statements, I will exalt my throne above God's. I will do this, I will do that. And when he got his eyes off of his gift or what he was supposed to be doing, the scripture says he was kicked out of heaven. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall as lightning from the sky. Amen. He fell. Listen, comparison will kill your joy. After this, Satan came, the Bible says, as a thief to kill, steal, and destroy. Any thief wants to kill from you, steal from you, and destroy you. And, and when you begin to compare, it will kill your joy. Amen. It will take it away. It will steal your peace. 
Comparison will suffocate your sanity. Amen. Compare yourself always to others. Comparison is the thief of joy. Uh, Thursday night, I, I went to the hospital, got called out for a man who had I had a stroke. He was, he was passing from this life. I knew the family from, uh, from our other church, and uh, they, they had called me and said, Pastor, I, I, don't, I know you don't know these folk. They're out of town, but they need somebody. So Joseph and I went over to the hospital. We got in the hospital, and it's, it's a cold call. You don't know what's going to happen there. I got in. I get talking to this guy, and he's heard me before actually at another funeral and he said to me he said pastor he said uh this is this the man that raised me he said i just i got i gotta have some help here and so i i i, I talked with him try to give him some clarity about eternity his love for god and then the guy told me he said uh, we're from alabama and we're boot we were bootleggers <laughs> well all of a sudden now i got a hook to work with well, I said, I too from Alabama, sir, and, and uh, my family were bootleggers, and, and, and uh, he said, oh yeah, he said, I, I'm, I'm a Roll Tide fan, I go to Alabama football games, and, and I went, oh come on, man, I feel, I feel like God brought me here to be with you, he man, got talking, I said, where do you live, man, he said, I live in Hondo, Texas, I said, you do, I said, I was in Hondo, Texas on Saturday on my birthday, riding through down to the St. Valentine's, and he finished it, Day Massacre, over at the fairgrounds, I said, that's right, that's where we rode to, and all of a sudden, I realized that God orchestrated this divine appointment for the me to be there with them and there was about other about 10 other guys that came in the room some of them were bikers and there was these connections being made and opportunity i got a message from him on friday thank you pastor for coming in uh for you know it, you couldn't believe the peace that we had after you left and and the issue was simply this i i was uh, uh well now I, i'm going to can't jump ahead of myself here so i'm on my way home and Lori sends me a message she said would you pick me up some from arby's well i, lo I love arby's there are two things I really love about Arby's. That stack of meat they put on that sandwich. With that sauce on there. And that man that says, we got the meats. The voice in the commercial, we got the meats. The thing was, that very day, I saw an article where Arby's was testing pizza. And they were testing pizza sliders and pizza. And I thought to myself, Arby's. There are 50 other restaurants out there. Pizza Hut, Pizza Inn, R.C.'s Pizza, Mott Pizza. They're, they, they're very good at pizza. Arby's, you're good at meat. Don't go to pizza. It don't even sound right. Arby's, we got the pizza. It don't sound right. So Arby's, I would say to you, stay in your lane. Everybody say, stay in your lane. So this morning, I would preach to you a thought, stay in your lane. You've got a gift that God gave you. You're going to discover the gifts that God gave you. With those gifts, you've got to stay in your lane, man. I can't push that, 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 that walker up faster than this guy next to me. I can't pump weights with all them big guys in there that all brooded up. I'm working out with a rubber band man. I'm the rubber band man from 1970. The rubber band man, Ken. You don't know that song, but I know that song. Amen. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm working through all this stuff, and one of the things I realized, I can't even compare myself with any of these guys matter of fact almost all the time in, in them places work out they got mirrors everywhere do you know I turn away from the mirrors the one thing I don't want to see right now is me I don't want to see how I'm doing it, how I look. Just tell me it's do I'm doing it the right way that's all I need to know if Chick-fil-a ever started selling hamburgers it's over their lane is chicken. Stay in your lane. I love that commercial uh, that, that uh, the guy, guy was giving the guy a tattoo, and he, and he said, are you good? And he said, well, I'm okay. And he looked at him, kind of funny. He said, you're okay? He said, yeah, man. He said, I'm okay. And he was giving him the tattoo, and he looked down at it, and the guy smiles at him and says, stay in your lane, bro. And I thought to myself, how many times as believers we get out of our lane? That we watch somebody else, that we observe somebody else's life, and, and we forget the gift of God in our own lives. Yeah, if you're not careful, you're going to uh, fall into a trap of comparing yourself to others. Amen. All through life, Galatians 6, 4, Paul said, make careful ex exploration of who you are and the work you have been given. Look at what you are and who, what you've been given. And then sink yourself into that. Don't be impressed with yourself. Don't compare yourself with others. Each of you must take responsibility for doing the creative best you can with your own life. It is the one thing that I fall into as a pastor of actually two churches, trying to be careful not to compare this church to the other church, though we're one body. I'm careful as a pastor when I gather around other pastors to look at their, all the stuff that they're doing and try to compare myself with everything that they're doing. You know, we don't have a light show. We don't have uh, smoke. We don't have, uh, I don't 
don't have this great backdrop of, of uh, video and all of that. We actually have a pulpit. Most churches I go to now, they got a little coffee table out there with a glass of water on it and a Bible, you know, and they walk around. And he sits in a chair. I, it blows me away. I watch it. He's sitting in a chair, and all he talks about is his wife, his kids, and his dog. And every now and then he throws in Jesus, and thousands of people show up to see him. And I think to myself, God, I'm, I'm so antiquated. I'm an antique. I'm so old when it comes to the ministry. I'm missing it. I need skinny jeans and funny shoes. Now, now I know what you're saying. You're saying no. But you don't understand the comparison. Because you begin to compare yourself with other people and other ministries and other successes. And I say, God, if, if this is what I'm doing and this is all that's happening, God, help me. Help me figure this thing out in life. You know, how, how am I going to do this? Do, do I need to sit in a chair? Do I need a coffee table? I like my pulpit. I like my gun holder here where it holds my gun. Amen. This metal shield that I can throw up at any time. Try that with a coffee table. Let me say it again. Do not compare yourself with others. Each of you must take responsibility for doing the creative best you can with, a, with your own life. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And ch 2 Corinthians 10 is Paul's defense of his ministry. To the point where he had to start defending himself. about He gave his ministry over to other people to take care of it. And they began to micromanage it. He said, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves they are not wise see comparison demoralizes and it removes the clarity of the call of God on your life by telling you to look at others we all have a, a call we all have a mission uh, my son-in-law came in last night and he said pastor guess what I'm licensed I said okay good I'm glad you got one uh, for what he said for ministry I found it I'm licensed I can I, I know ordained he said I'm ordained I laughed at him I said very few people I know are really ordained but I know a lot of people that are licensed. Years ago, there was a publication called National Enquirer. And you go to the back of it, and you could actually order an ordination so you could do weddings. Let me tell you, just because you order an ordination don't mean. Amen. Just because you think you're licensed. I know a lot of people got driver's license. They can't drive. <laughs> so Paul's saying here that when you begin to measure, measure yourself, all of us got this gift. And we talked about it in earthen, in earthen treasures, in, in jars of clay. Paul is addressing, he's defending his ministry. And he's, he finally got to the place he didn't want to, you can tell. But he, people began to stir up trouble. He gave them their ministry, a, a ministry to do, and they began to micromanage it. Paul didn't do that. He turned it over to someone. And one of the things I've learned in life, don't micro. When I say micro, that means that, Sister Diane, when you meet, I want to know everything that's going on in the meeting. Uh, Diane, when you meet, I want to know everything that's going on in the meeting. Everything that's going on. Uh, to Ken, when y'all have you meet, I want to know. I don't. I say teach them. Amen. This week, Mike Thies and the, and the group, uh, and Lucinda, went up to, to, to Livingston. I, I didn't say, what are you going to talk about? What are you going to teach? Because what happens is you fall into insecurity. You think that they're doing something against you. i got to believe that the leaders we've turned loose with the gifts that they got have the absolute best interest of this house in hand. Amen. And they're going to do something. But Paul struggled because they began to micro. They began to make it about themselves. They came against his leadership. They came against his character. They implied that he was a lousy speaker. He wrote good letters. But when they heard him in person he was not impressive amen I, so they begin to put him down and for a preacher that is bad press it's really bad he gathers his thoughts he puts priority to his life and the victim becomes the teacher to those that are around him and he says it and i'm going to say it again from the living bible amen the trouble with some men is that they are only comparing themselves with each other and measuring themselves against their own little ideas that's stupidity listen there are all kinds of people proud passive complex unteachable, uh, defiant, defensive, underachieving, overachieving, perfectionist. You, you get the point. We try to compare ourselves to all of them. No wonder we feel empty. One of the things in life, when, in, when you compare, if you're not careful, you compare yourself to the weakest, to the ones that are downtrodden, and you see how much better you are. But then when you start looking and comparing yourself to those that are up and, and out, the next thing you know, then you start feeling insecure and defeated. That's why the scripture says, don't compare yourself with others. If you could do the job, you know, we got to say, so, well, you know, if you, you're more like so-and-so, you could do the job like so-and-so. We, if we work 
Uh, if we work on ourselves, if I could sing, I'd do more in the church. If I could speak and teach, I would excel at, at, at work more. If only I could get a break like so-and-so, I would have all of those. We call that keeping up with the Joneses. We live in a day and an age where most people are hurting. They are carrying a lot of baggage in their life. They're looking at someone else to be like. And truth be told, those people are as bad as some of us. I've seen the, the athletes and the musicians, and we hold them up, and we, we admire them, and we look at them, and we try to emulate them and realize they're dirtbags. Amen. With a gift. They're showing. And all of us are there, too. All we have to do to fulfill our mission is stay in our lane and keep our eyes on Jesus. Stay in your lane. You want to hear the good gospel? Real simple. Stay in your lane and keep your eyes on Jesus. Stay in your lane and keep your eyes on Jesus. Ephesians 2 tells me that, that for we are God's handiwork. The word is masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I am his masterpiece. Say it with me. I am his masterpiece. Amen. When God created you, he had a thought of you, and he put you here with fingerprints that nobody else has, a DNA that nobody else has. He made you a masterpiece. Everything about you, from, from the head to the toe, he made. And I look at myself sometimes, I say, no, God, I know you think it's a masterpiece, but, but I, I'm, uh, oh, I don't know. And God says, I know, you're my boy. I love you just like you are. Amen. If you want to lose some weight, I'm cool with you. If you gain weight, I'm cool with you. You're my masterpiece, boy. Amen. You just got to feel good about pressing through life. Listen, the thing we have to do, and I know we think the other lane is always moving faster. I'm downtown all the time. That traffic going to bottle up right before I get downtown, Bob, to see you. And I'll be in the lane. And I'll look over, and the lane next to me is moving faster than my lane. And I'm thinking to myself, all I got to do is move over into this lane here. And I'll get there faster. As sure as I move into this lane, the truck that was behind me in the other lane is now ahead of me. I have found out that once you get in a crowd like that, just stay in your lane, bro. Amen. Just stay where you're at, and eventually you're going to get there. Give yourself a little time. Can I get an amen? you got to ask yourself a question. Do I ever feel jealous around people who are more talented or have more opportunities than I? If the question is yes, you have to understand that the abilities we have come from God. Each of us have been given at least one talent, amen, and many abilities. Comparing our abilities and talents, it causes jealousy in your life. Saul was the king of Israel. The Bible says he was head and shoulders taller than anyone else. Matter of fact, the Bible says that he was handsome. Now listen to me. If the Bible calls you handsome, you handsome. You may say that Saul had king swag. Everywhere he went, I could see him walking in, you know, and he got that little strut and stagger to him. He looking good. He wears his clothing well, fits from shoulder to shoulder. Amen. He's, he, he, he got that big sword. Hallelujah. Jonathan looks up to his daddy. He, he's got it going on. That, that's this man Saul. He's the king of all Israel. He's blessed to be king. Let me, let me say this to you very carefully. If the brightness of the blessing blinds you from the blesser, it will become a curse. I'm going to say it again. This is that moment where you take your phone out and take a picture of that to remind yourself. If the brightness of the blessing blinds you from the blesser, it will become a curse. If you get in your life where you think you all that because you you something, you're missing it. Amen. It will take a... God blessed you. God favored you. God gifted you. God gave you the abilities to do the things you've done in your life. And when you quit giving him the appreciation and the thanks, amen, all of a sudden it's going to become a curse. Saul was blessed of God, anointed to be the king. He had it all going in his life. But all of a sudden, all that blessing began to blind him from the real blessing in his life. If you looked at Saul's life, my friend, Saul had become more concerned with his position than God's presence. He was all about, you know, who I am. I'm the king. I'm the, I'm the guy. But when it came to one who cared not for time, 
He did not care for position or prestige, but for the presence of God. That would be David, a young man out in the fields, taking care of the sheep of his father. He was a man who was commendable. He did not procrastinate. He was a guy that got up, he took care of, and when he had time, he took his harp or his musical instrument, and he gave God praise, and he sang to God, and, and all he needed was an audience of the sheep that he had. He didn't care about anything other than giving God glory. He didn't want a, a title. He didn't want a prestige. He, didn't, he wasn't sick to be king. He wasn't after it. He wasn't trying to cut in line to get up there. He wasn't trying to cut short process to do it. He was just David. David was this ruddy, red-headed young man and, and when the prophet came to anoint the king, the next king, God said, I know there's a king there, but he's all about himself. He, everything about him, he, he looks at this and he thinks of his com comparison to others. He's all of that, but I need one young man. He goes in, you know the story, they tried to anoint the boys, all of his brothers, but none of them were the right guy. They get David, they bring Bring him in. Hey, the oil flows over him. He's oily, man. But he's got a post-dated anointing. This anointing says that you'll be king later when Saul's gone. Ain't nothing like having a post-dated check. Somebody give you a $100,000 check, and it's dated for July 2020. You can't cash it till July 2020. And you're looking at that, and you're saying to yourself, man, I sure wish I got the money. I could buy a house. I could buy a car. I could help my family. I could go, I could go to college. I got all this, but it's post-dated. That was David's anointing. So he had to live life with his post-dated anointing, knowing soon he would be king, but he's not going to be there now. And he goes out as a young boy, anointed, oily, gets some cheese, gets some bread, still serving, but he's got a king's heart, a love for God, a worship for God. He goes out to the battlefield when he gets gets there, he, 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 he hears this cursing of this giant who's defying, defiling and defying God, and he gets to this little angst inside of him, because that's the God he sings about when he's out in the sheep fields, and, and he asks a question, is there not a reason, is there not a cause that somebody rise up and do something, and this young boy with this gift inside of him, this ability to sling a stone, to throw, to throw an arrow, this young boy that had all of these abilities that God had begun to perfect in him as he exercised it out into the field, David goes out and he looks at his brother and said, is there not a cause his brothers rebuke him, said, where are you your sheep. They, the Bible says he just turned his back on him. Sometimes you got to turn your back on all the negativity in this world. All them people out there, they don't think you something, that you've got that gift. So he turns his back and Saul hears about it and Saul brings him in and says, what do you think you can do? He says, I can take down that giant. How do you know you can take down that giant? I took down a lion and I took down a bear. My friend, I am gifted. I am gifted. I have a gift inside of me. I do not fear anything bigger than me. I, I, I do not compare myself to him. I am the, I'm the king's boy. That's who I am. So they put Saul's armor on him. It doesn't fit. Again, Saul's this tall. This boy's this tall. He's walking around like a, like a toddler in his daddy's cowboy boots. He feels funny. He said, I can't go in these. I have not tried them. I've not worked in them. He puts them aside. He runs to a brook. He stops and he grabs five stones out of the brook. He puts them into his pouch. He runs toward He finds five smooth. Everybody say smooth. Five smooth stones, amen, that will fly straight. He puts them into that pouch, into that dark place, amen, and he runs. Now, the reason some people say that David picked up five stones is because Goliath had four brothers. Sometimes when you take on one family member, you get them all. So here he goes out, and he takes that giant, and the giant's yelling at him. You want to talk about comparison? If David would have compared himself to the enemy that was before him, he would have never faced that enemy. But David walked in the Spirit of God, realizing that God had his back. And if God's got my back, then I don't have to compare myself to this monster in front of me. And the giant comes out. He's yelling defiance at Israel. He's mocking the God of Israel. You understand, whoever wins this battle gets all the spoils. David goes out, looks at Goliath, grabs a stone, puts it in his sling, and the Scripture says he runs toward him. He didn't compare and run away. He knew if I took a lion down, I took a bear down, they're more ferocious than you. And I told somebody this the other day. They, they said, that, that ain't in there. I said, read it again. There's an armor bearer standing in front of Goliath. He's there. He's got a shield. He's walking everywhere Goliath goes. His armor bearer is going with him. So when David faced not one, but two guys bigger than him, and yet he was not backing off, he takes a stone, whirls it through the air, hits Goliath upside the head. It penetrates his skull. Goliath falls. I believe he fell forward. And when he fell forward, he squashed the little armor bearer. So if you were flying over in the Goodyear blimp, you saw four legs under one guy. Look a little funny, wasn't it? 
At that moment, when he hit him with that rock and put him to the ground, David became a rock star. That's okay, you'll get it tomorrow. Uh huh. Amazing. This battle, this defeat. One moment, one defining moment changed everything. Up until this moment, I was a, a carrier of bread and cheese. Up to this moment, my brothers made fun of me in my necklace that had lion's teeth and bear claws on it. They thought I found them. Up until this moment, everything was just simple. But now I've taken down the Goliath of the Philistines. Everything changed. Everybody in this house has a defining moment. It, and it can, be, it can make you or it can break you. The issue is preparation for it. That you prepare for that job interview, that job promotion, that you prepare for that marriage, that you prepare for whatever it is that God has uh, the, the, as you move through age, uh, retirement. But there's a defining moment in everybody's life that makes you or breaks you. This could have destroyed David and destroyed all of Israel. We'd have never had 2 Samuel. But yet, here we are at this defining moment. I remember years ago. I can tell you when it was. It was 1990. I walked into a college, and they had this International Ministerial Association. There was, there was 100 pastors there. And I walked in, and I'm, I'm wearing a double-breasted suit. Never forget it. Tie. And I had these curls that came down the back of my head I had the finest looking mullet you've ever seen and I walked into that meeting and the speaker the day speaker was unable to speak and somebody said have you ever heard Jerry preach and they cut me loose one service as a matter of fact I was heading on the road watch this traveling as an evangelist and I had one meeting one meeting down in Galliano, Louisiana. One meeting. And I'm leaving my job, my ministry, and taking it on the road. And I stop in there to preach in May. My first meeting's in June. And it cut me loose. I preached like a house on fire. They have never heard a mullet preach like that in their life. Amen. I ran pews. I raised the dead. I cast out devils. Amen. Things were going crazy in that room. The preachers. And when, as soon as it was, it was over, I walked into a room and I sat down. Sweaty, excited. And I knew that I delivered my bed. Didn't try to show off. I just preached the word of God as I knew it. And I sat down. And men started coming up to me and saying, Would you come preach for me? Would you come preach for me? Would you come preach for me? Would you? Our church needs to hear you. Our church needs to hear you. You are just here. And next thing I knew, watch this. For three years, I was booked. For three years. Out of one defining moment. That, that thing launched everything that I just about do today. That one service. You never know when that Goliath is going to fall. You never know when you're going to face something. And you can't compare yourself. Say, well, I don't have, I'm not gifted for it. I'm not made for this. When God sets you up for like that, my friend, you got to take that move. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 5. Whenever, whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, women came out from all over the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs, and with timbrels and lyres. Now, this was something that would happen all the time. Every time they went out to battle, they came in for victory. The girls would come out and get to sing. Oh, it ain't nothing like hearing the girls sing and beat them tambourines and tell you how wonderful you are. As they moved into the town, verse 8, Saul was very angry. This refrain, look at it, verse 7. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. With what more can he get out but from the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. He was prophesying in his house. While David was playing the lyre, 
Amen. Of the, uh, which would be like a harp. As he usually did Saul, did, Saul had a spear in his hand. And he hurled it, saying to him, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, with David, but had departed from Saul. Saul said this in, in this verse that I'm reading, but me. They're singing about David, but me, they not giving me no accolades. I meet a lot of but me people. They all, you know, you're doing good, but me, what about me? But, but, but me, how about me? What about me? What, you know, you're, you're talking about him all the time, but what about me? Paul, you know, Saul was unable to separate his success from David's success. The women sang the song. As a matter of fact, where did the comparison come from? David didn't compare his, his, his life and fight. David didn't do it. Uh, Saul didn't say anything. The comparison came from other people. And I say this to every leader in this house, every mom and dad in this house. Be careful of what other people try to compare you to. Amen. Listen to the voices outside. It was the girls that said it. It was the girls that said, Saul has killed his thousands. David his ten thousands. If you have a hard time, the, but, but when I see a but me believer, the, this is how you know you're there. If you have a hard time celebrating other people's victory, you've heard me say in this house for a year, you, sir, you celebrate everybody's victory till your victory gets here. Amen. If you ain't healed yet, you celebrate somebody else's victory. You know, you, you've been wanting adoption, but you ain't got no kids that somebody else got. You celebrate their victory till, they get, till, till theirs gets here. If you're still driving a Chevy, don't worry about it. You just celebrate everybody's got a Dodge until you're able to get there. Can I get an amen? If you're complimenting someone else, take something from you. If me got to tell you, and I fight with this. There are times I just don't say no. I'd rather not say nothing to you. I don't want to compliment you. So I got to fight with this but me moment because I can be one of them believers too. If you're complimenting someone else, I got a phone call the other day. And, no, the sister said to me, uh, Pastor, uh, uh, I'm fixing to go into a legal battle with somebody. They don't know it's happening, but I'm walking into the courthouse and they're not there. What, what should I do? Should I call them and remind them they need to be there also? They've never given me that consideration. And I said, call them and tell them they're supposed to meet you. But that's being nice. I uh, know. Because you never go wrong doing right. So if you just do the right thing here, and I don't care how bad they've been to you in business, you just do the right thing. Remind them we've got to get th through this. We've got to get on with our lives and deal with closure. If there's anyone in your life, you would secretly take pleasure in their failure. Mm -hmm. I ain't talking about divorce here. Quit. Be nice. Your boss fired you. Be nice. Some of us, we take pleasure. Oh, man, if we could just see them fall. We could see them go down. I've had people in my own life I knew took pleasure waiting to see my failures. Amen. And when I did, they gloated. When I started back up again and passed them up again, I just smiled. Thank you, Jesus. God never repented of the gift he gave me. Amen. You give somebody a gift, people are going to find you with that gift. Can I get an amen? Amen. Watch it. Saul, Saul was, by the way, he's just human. He just, we all struggle with this. Oh, don't we? Watch this. Here it is. There it is. That's just one thing. Right there. That thing of, oh. And, uh, let's see. I went out on the battlefield. Oh, somebody's watching me right now on the app. That is funny. Uh, uh, went out on the battlefield. Hit Goliath upside the head with one rock. He dead now. <gasps> Saul was with me. He gave me permission. Saul got 1,000 likes. And David got 10,000 likes. Saul opens up his phone. Looks down at it and says, You kidding me? He got t I set him up to kill the Goliath. Had I not sent him out there, Goliath wouldn't be dead now. Why well, I got a thousand likes and he got ten thousand likes. Did you know that right now they're looking at trying to figure out how to stop this nonsense and madness because teenagers are committing suicide? Because they don't get the esteem that they think they need, that they're not the internet sensation that they think they are. And adults fall in this same thing. That so and so, you know, it used to be so and so. Pastor didn't shake my hand at the door. Now so and so, pastor didn't like my stuff. And I never saw your stuff. I've actually had people get mad at me and say, "You, it was on Facebook." <laughs> like I saw it. The focus became on him, and then off his lane. He got out of it. 
Envy, envy is a terrible thing. Envy is a feeling of discontent or covetousness with regard to another's advantages, successes, and possessions. Amen. When you fall into just being a but me believer, social media has brought such awareness of others' lives to begin to hate yours. You'll look at it. Listen, guys, awareness accelerates discontent. When you're aware of something, it begins to cause discontent in your life. Uh, we know Adam and Eve, they were cool in the garden. You know they were. The Bible says they were without clothing. I believe Eve was probably a size one. How you know that, Pastor? Because she was without clothing. She looking good. Adam was looking good. Everything was fine. But awareness brought discontent. What happened was when they took the apple, sin entered into the life. And they were aware of who they were. And they ran out of the garden. They clothed themselves. Probably started eating fried food. Amen. Everything again. Awareness will accelerate the discontent in your life. You've got to be careful when that takes place. The likes of social media have been connected to depression, anxiety. Again, teenage suicide. Uh, our phones have become mirrors that we're constantly checking for our reflection and looking into it. When the Bible tells us this here is our mirror. Amen. When I look in this, I compare myself to Jesus. Amen. I realize that's the only one I'm supposed to compare myself to. And I, every day, will fall a little bit short, fall a lot short. Amen. And I got to keep pressing in. But here we are. We stare at our phones. You remember the old saying from what was that, uh, 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 what was that little girl that ran through the woods there? Um, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who, who, was, who was that one? Snow White? Mirror, mirror, the little witch. Mirror, mirror on the, not Snow White, the witch in the show. Uh, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? Mirror, mirror on Facebook. Tell me how I'm supposed to look. Mirror, mirror on Instagram. Tell me who I really am. Come on up. And we miss it. Saul was looking at David and got out of his lane. We began to compare ourselves. You're the most beautiful. You are the most handsome when you realize just who you are. And the gifts that you've got. We're all going to fight this struggle of comparison. I can preach this till I'm blue in the face. And I still find myself looking somewhere else. Comparing myself to somebody else. Comparing my preaching. I, somebody, I, I've heard people say, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll look at worship. And I know some of you were at a great concert last night. And man, I'm telling you, it took thousands of dollars to put that concert on, to make that concert happen. And, and, and I, cause I, I saw you on Facebook. I, I was stalking many of you. And uh, I didn't hit like. I just was stalking you, just letting you know. Uh, but, but we come to church and we compare our band with other bands. We, we compare our musicians with other musicians. We compare our preachers with other... Because I hear it said, well, you know, I wish we did it this way. I wish we did it that way. We, we, we compare so many things in our life. And the worst part is sometimes we begin to compare our children with each other. I found years ago that all of our children are uniquely different. Yeah. And that's why I quit being fair. So I said, well, you've got to be fair to your kids. What you do for one, you can do... No, you can't. You can't never do that. Amen. Every child is different. Every child has different needs in their life. The lo and I'll, I'll say this so I'm blue in the face too. I will favor whoever's favoring the Father. Amen. If you favor me, you're going to get my blessing. Amen. If you're a knothead around me, well, you just be a knothead. But if you want to favor me, oh my goodness. I, I'm going to bless you. I'm, going to get, I'm already giving you the secret to who I am and how I will bless you. Amen. If you favor me. But if you don't, and it works that way. If you're favoring the Father, and everybody in here can favor. I've often said I'm the Father's favorite, but you can be too. It's your call. Right. He's daddy enough for all of us. Amen. Comparing yourself to others is missing what God has for your life. Paul said it was stupidity. It's vanity. Romans 12, and I close. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you are, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members. And these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we who are many, we form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, giving the word of God, sharing the future, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, did you know serving is a gift? Not everybody's good at it. There are some people, I'll go to a restaurant, and they have what they call servers. 
And they come out, and they are bumbling. They can't remember nothing. They'll look at you and try to be cool with your order by not writing it down. And you don't get what you ordered. And you think to yourself, I'm going to tip that. But then you'll get somebody that will come out, and they are gifted. Oh, my goodness. They will wait on you. They'll take your order. They, they come back. They check it. Your water never goes down. Things are good. Napkins on the table. When that's over, man, you say, that person is gifted in serving. Yeah. Made, there are people in this house. All of us can serve. But there are some folk that are really just good at it. Amen. They think ahead. They get things done. You have a gift for that? Use that gift because that's a part of the body. Let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. Do you know some people just got the gift of encouragement? Do you know some people got the gift of encouragement whenever they walk away from you? Folk got gifts. They just need to learn to use it. Amen. The gift of encouraging. When they're around, I just feel encouraged. If, if it is contributing to the needs of others, let them give generously. Did you know some people have a gift of giving? It's like they have never run out of finances. God just keeps blessing them with it. And they keep using it and being a blessing with it. They have a gift of giving. Now, I believe everybody can be a giver. But then there are people that got a gift of giving. They're just good at it. They know where to put the seed to bring forth the biggest results. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Mercy is a gift. And you know what comes back when you give mercy? Mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. David, you're talking about that, which goes out. It's important that you sow mercy. And everybody here should be able to sow mercy and give mercy. Stand with me. Say it with me. Stay in your lane. Now look at your neighbor and say, stay in your lane. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you're a husband and wife, you already know that you are in two separate lanes. Amen? Stay in your lane. Stay, stay where God put you. If you're a man, God gave you a lane. If you're a woman, God gave you a lane. Stay in your lane. Whatever gift you've got to administer while you're on this earth, Use that gift for the glory of God. Don't let envy rob you. Saul, Saul was king, man. And he looked at David and he let other people force him to hate David by expressing their love for him. Uh, every time we bring in new ministers and staff members, I give them a book called The Tale of Three Kings. And it's a story, Ronnie, of King Saul, King David, and Absalom. And how in life... All of us want to be a David. But you don't know you're a David yet till you get old enough to experience an Absalom. Someone in your life that you raised up that's trying to take from you. And how you going to handle that in business, in parenthood, in ministry. And everybody, we try to act like we not saw. But we trying to hold on to things. And then we get jealous of the younger groups coming behind us. When we ought to be complimenting and releasing them. You follow me? Oh, it's a, it's a hard balance act to work through. I've seen it work in families. Amen. Where, where there's a Saul and an Absalom and a David. Whether it be male or female, I've seen it work in families. Where, where they haven't quite figured it out yet. Amen. So I've worked toward this. So when I preach this, I'm not preaching to you. I'm talking to me. Because i got to learn how to release what I need to release. Hang on to and build what I need to build. And this delicate balance in life as we dance for and, and stay in my lane. I'm, I'm learning when I get around other preachers and I listen to them talk. Some of them want my lane. You, you can't have in my lane, bro. It's my lane. And I don't want in your lane. I walk in, I walked into Lakewood Church. I looked around at that mega church. And the only thing I thought about was who cleans the glass in this place? I'm glad I ain't got to vacuum this floor. I didn't even think about preaching down there. That, 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 don't even bother, that doesn't bother me at all. I can't preach anybody on that stage. But that, that, that doesn't bother me. What gets me is who's going to take care of this big building? Amen. I'm too old to have to deal with all that right now. I like being paid off. Right. 
Heads bowed, eyes closed, across the building. Comparison will remove us from our destiny. It allows us not to use the gifts and talents in our lane. God never repented for putting a gift inside your earthen vessel. But envy, my friend, this discontent, covetousness, looking at other people all the time, what they got, what you ain't got, can rob you. Pastor, I think you, you were not just talking to you this morning. You were talking to me. You were speaking to me. Could I see you if that's you? Just put your hand up and back down. You don't have to hold it up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just up and down. I just want to make sure I got half the church here. If I didn't get to half the church, I'm going to re-preach it. There it is. There's more hands. Thank you. Pray this with me. Lord Jesus, I am who I am by the grace of God. Help me to stay in my lane, to use my gift for your glory. I'm going to give you the praise, give you the thanks. You're my God. You're my King. You're my Savior. Forgive me my shortcomings. I see a line on the right. I see a line on the left. I see that I have boundaries. Keep me in my lane. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give God a praise in here.